Hi, on behalf of World Mizrahi and Kosher Travelers, it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this mini-series of virtual Jewish heritage tours to Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, India and Italy. But first, a brief look at my personal journey. I'm a first-generation South African. My late mother was born in Lithuania, my late father was born in Latvia, and my late grandmother, who I refer to as Boba Baylor, regaled me with stories of her youth in Lithuania, still in the times when it was behind the Iron Curtain. And that fired my imagination about my personal history and where we came from. But this all came to life in 1996, when the Jewish Agency invited me and a group of other people to participate in the Future Leaders Forum, we were taken to various countries in Eastern Europe to see the work of the Jewish Agency in repatriating Jews to the Holy Land, to the State of Israel. So what were black and white photographs in my childhood all of a sudden had depth, perspective and colour. In 1996 I went to Poland, in 1997 I went with the Jewish Agency to Lithuania and thereafter for 15 years I travelled with World Mizrahi from Argentina in the west to China and Japan in the east, to India, to Western Europe, to Eastern Europe and explored the rich Jewish culture and history which is contained in those countries. Approximately five years ago David Wallace, who together with his wife Chana run Kosher Travelers, phoned the Chief Rabbi of South Africa, Rabbi Dr. Warren Goldstein, and asked him that since he had just written a book with Rabbi Beryl Wine about the Jews of Lithuania, if he would be able to join them as their scholar in residence on tours of Lithuania. The Chief Rabbi politely declined and said that he had too much on his plate to deal with, but they should speak to Hugh Reichland who is a practicing attorney but has spent many years researching Lithuania and many other countries and has traveled there and seen the places themselves. They called me and since then we have had an incredible relationship where I've been their scholarly residence for trips to Lithuania, Belarus, Morocco, India and many other countries across Europe. I firmly believe that in order to fully understand ourselves, we have to understand where we come from. I believe that every Jew taps into a stream of consciousness that goes back from the time of Abraham until today, where we are part of everything that our people have experienced. I see the hand of God Almighty, that through this window of history, we can see how we've been guided, how we have survived against all odds. And not only that we've survived, but we have thrived and we have made an inordinate contribution to the world. So I therefore invite you, on behalf of World Mizrahi and Kosher Travelers, to have a taste on this virtual travel. But that one day, I hope that you will meet me in person and that I will meet you and together we will get on the bus, get on the train, get on the plane and go and visit these magnificent communities all over the world and see and appreciate the magic and the majesty of Jewish history. That means hello in Greek. My name is Hugh Reichlin and it is my pleasure and privilege to take you on a virtual Jewish heritage tour of Greece. We start off with a beautiful photograph taken of a Jewish Greek family, probably sometime in the early 20th century, wearing their traditional garb. What's also interesting is that two of the young gentlemen at the back of the photograph are holding the traditional bozuki or Greek guitar. So you can see straight away that these are people that are Greek in culture, but of course Jewish by religion and Jewish by passion, Jewish by heritage. And they are part of an ancient Jewish community. Many say that it is the oldest Jewish community on earth as far as Europe is concerned, that managed to retain their Judaism 
for over 2,000 years in Greece. Let us have a look at the map of Greece and you can see that uh, in, the, in the extreme north you've got uh, Albania and Bulgaria, in the east you've got Turkey and towards the center of the map we see Greece and particularly Athens just under the word Greece you'll see Athens more or less in the center of your screen and at the top Thessaloniki. The two main Jewish communities of Greece lived in Athens, which was a smaller community, even though it is the capital of Greece and has been for many, many years. And Thessaloniki at the top was where most of the Jews of Greece lived. And it was a thriving, beautiful, large community. And we're going to spend time in both Athens and Thessaloniki, as well as visiting many of the towns and villages in between those two cities. I took a bus ride from Athens right up to Thessaloniki and that was the way that we were able to, with World Mizrahi a number of years ago, traverse a beautiful culture of the Greek Jews. So if we return to the map, you see just below the word Greece, Corinth, and that was a very old, and it still exists to this day, a very old city and a very important port. And it joins the Gulf of Corinth with the Saronic Gulf. And if you see on the map over there, there's a very small land piece in between. And Corinth has got two ports on those both sides of the Gulf. Corinth was in fact one of the largest cities of the ancient world and was a center of trade and commerce. And as we've seen through a number of the virtual travels that we've done, the Jews generally tend to gravitate to place places of commerce and commercial activity. That's what drew them to Thessalonica. That's what drew them to Corinth. That's what drew Jews to New York and other places of commerce across the world. It had a strategic position between those two gulfs and had two harbors. In the first century of the Common Era, Paul, or as we know him in the Talmud, Shaul, Shaul Mitarshish, Paul the Apostle came for a Shabbat to Corinth and actually spoke in one of the synagogues or perhaps even a few of the synagogues in Corinth to try and persuade people towards the religion which he was going to be a part of and create, which is Christianity as we know it today. And here we see a close-up of one of those synagogues that was there during the time of the Apostle Paul. And you can see the structure and it very much is part of the architecture that was in Greece and in Rome and other parts of the ancient world 2,000 years ago. Probably one of the oldest buildings in which we had a synagogue that is still in the world today. Let us briefly have an overview of the different kinds of Greek Jewish communities that were in Greece for all the centuries. The largest group were the Romaniots. Those were the, known as the traditional Greek Jews. Then they were the earliest Jews in the country and they were there over 2,000 years ago and spoke a language called Yavanic. Unfortunately, nobody speaks it today. All the Jews of Greece speak Greek or Hebrew. There were large communities of Romania Jews in Ioannina, Tebes, Chalkis, Corfu and Corinth, the island of Rhodos and Cyprus. The Greek Jews are distinct from Svardim and they are not Ashkenazim either. They have their own tradition that goes back all these centuries. And it's known as the Minhag Romania. The traditional Jewish prayers that were recited and chanted in Greek were written in Hebrew letters. Ashkenazim came to the country in 1376 from Hungary and Germany to escape persecution. And later Jews came in from France as well into Greece. The Svardim arrived in Greece, about 30,000 of them, after the expulsion of the Jews by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in Spain, and that was in around 1492 and the years afterwards, and they settled mainly in Thessaloniki, which we mentioned earlier, in the north of the country, which became the Jewish, biggest Jewish community in Greece. The Ottomans, who were in control at that time, actually welcomed the Jews because they saw this as an opportunity for the Jews to improve their economy. And the Jews established the first printing press in Thessaloniki 
and Thessaloniki soon became a blossoming successful center of commerce and learning and was known as Madre the Israel, the mother of Israel. And the language was Judea Espanol, which we also know today as Ladino. The Jews brought that language from Spain and spoke it in Greece and uh, various other places. And uh, it's a well-known language still in the world today for those that have carried it forward. And the Jews of Thessaloniki were also well known for their high level of education. This is the atrium in Pella with a pebble mosaic dating back to 399 BCE, which is the birthplace of Alexander the Great. And I find this absolutely fascinating that we are able to look at a mosaic floor and still some of the columns that were there at the time of Alexander the Great 2400 years ago. We went to Delphi and this is a beautiful photograph of Delphi and still some of the ancient buildings that were there from 586 BCE, two and a half thousand years ago. Here is an amphitheater where the athletes used to participate in the Pythian Games, which is the precursor of the Olympic Games as we have today. So you can see in immediately over here that influence that the Greeks have had on the rest of the world because all of us know about the Olympic Games and this is the birthplace. These Pythian Games took place in this very place on earth that we see over here. This was built to serve Apollo and the Greeks believed this per particular place to be the center of the earth. And the very well-known stories of the Oracle of Delphi that people used to go for advice to Delphi to find out what the future held for them from the Oracle. So to understand Jewish history in the context of Greek history, we have to understand what was the contribution of ancient Greece to the world today? Well, Greece was in fact the birthplace of democracy of Western philosophy, the Olympic Games, as we've mentioned. Greece was the source of Western literature and historiography, political science, major scientific and mathematical principles came from the Greek people. The whole study of geography originated in Greece, the study of biology of plants and animals. A university education was introduced into the world by the Greek people. Coinage, the use of coins in commerce, originated in Greece. And the whole concept of the Western drama of tragedy and comedy evolved from the Greek view of the world and the various mythologies that are around Greek culture. Let us see some of the history of Greece very briefly in the 20th century. So Greece was one of the first countries to accept the Balfour Declaration. In 1934, there was a large emigration to Palestine of Jews and 500 dock workers went to Haifa and they were very much in control of the port of Haifa and they had learned how to be stevedores and, and very full other positions in, in, in the shipping industry from being in Thessaloniki, which was the major port of Greece and they brought those skills across to Israel in the 1930s. In 1930, in, in, in 1941, in, during World War II, there were 12,898 Greek Jews in the army and the best known and most famous Jew in the army was Colonel Mordechai Fritzis, a Romaniot Jew from Chalkis. And there's to this day a street named after him in Athens. And he was very well known for having repelled a major part of the Italian army when they attacked Greece. In 1942, 2.5 million drachmas was paid as a bribe to keep out the Nazis from Greece, but unfortunately it only bought the Jews one year before the Nazis came in in 1943. Interesting to note that in 43, Archbishop Damaskinos Papandrao instructed the Greek Orthodox Church to issue false baptismal certificates to Jewish people, and he saved the lives of thousands of Jews. Archbishop Papandrao spoke about the unbreakable bonds between Christian Orthodox and Jews. Unfortunately, 46,000 Greek Jews were sent to their death in Auschwitz and most of the 60 synagogues of Greece were destroyed. The ignoble story of Mer Kolas, who was a collaborator on the, with the Nazis on the island of Corfu, 
Only 200 Jews of the 1900 Jews of Corfu managed to survive because he sold them out to the Nazis. In World War II, approximately 60 to 70,000 Jews of Greece died. 81% of the pop Greek pop Jewish Greek population of Greece were murdered. In contrast to Meir Karer, who collaborated with the Nazis on the island of Corfu, we have the most wonderful story of tremendous heroism on another island, the island of Zakynthos. When the Nazis came to Zakynthos to arrest the Jews and to deport them to Auschwitz, they came to the bishop and asked him to hand them a list of all the Jews on the island. The bishop said, the only two Jews on the island are myself and Mayor Lucas Carrer, and he gave them the list with two names. In fact, these brave Greeks had hidden all 275 Jews on the island, and the Nazis left without taking a single Jewish soul. Those Jews later left the island and made their way to Palestine and other parts of Greece, including Athens. These two incredible heroes, Bishop Chrysostomos and Lucas Carrer, are honored at Yad Vashem as amongst the righteous amongst the nations. And there's a photograph of these two wonderful human beings in front of you. We also went to the island of Rhodos, which has a very long history. So we've mentioned the island of Corfu, we mentioned the island of Zakynthos, and now we talk about the island of Rhodos, which was a place where the Jews came in the late 15th century after being expelled from Spain. And this is a visual of the island of Rhodos, which makes one think of Tzfat, in Israel. And there we saw the beautiful synagogue, the Kahal Shalom, Shalom synagogue in the Chuderia, which was the Jewish area of Rhodos, and it was built in 1577, some 80 or 90 years after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, and it is the oldest functioning shul or synagogue in Greece. The square is known as the square of the Hebrew martyrs in La Chuderia in Rhodos, and this is a visual of that beautiful town square on the island. We see here a plaque on the synagogue of Kahal Shalom and it commemorates the names of those Jews who lost their lives on the island that were deported to Auschwitz. And in fact, many of these Jews of Rhodos, those that survived, those that had left the, the, the island before the war, went to Africa, to various parts of Africa. They went to the Congo, they went to Zimbabwe, and later on to South Africa. And there are family names on this particular plaque that I recognized as a South African Jew as being our Swadi brothers and sisters from the island of Rhodos uh, that, uh, that escaped and are in South Africa today. A picture that I grew up with, I lived in a part of Johannesburg where there were a number of Greeks and I remember many of the Greek men would sit together and I often wondered where were their wives, where were the women, but this is a cultural thing amongst the Greeks that they get together during the day for their coffee, particularly the older men enjoy their coffee with their male friends. We were then traversing and I mentioned at the beginning that we went on a bus ride from Athens right up through the center of the country to finish off in Thessaloniki at the top. And here you see a road sign to Yonina, a very famous city for Jews over many, many centuries. And here is a beautiful visual of the old part of Yonina, where the Jews used to live, a narrow street. And then the entrance to the old city, which has a large, which has a very thick wall. And this is the entrance, the gateway to the, towards the synagogue. And here is the synagogue of Yanina. This is the, the front entrance, the front wall, and we went through the gate and we saw that this building had been built in 1877, but the Jews had been there for centuries before. But this was known as the old synagogue in this particular city. And this is a photograph of the front of the synagogue and the actual entrance to the synagogue building itself. The outside courtyard with my wife in what must have been the sukkah at one point in time. And the interior of the synagogue with the lovely columns and arches. On the right hand side, the Arun Kodesh, the Holy Ark. Sifrei Torah, some of them going back to the time of the Spanish exiles. 
And here is a, a Torah, and you can see it's in the Sfardi style, although we said that the Romaniots were not Sfardi or Ashkenazi, but this particular Sefer Torah was brought by the Jews from Spain when they came in the early 15th or late 15th century, early 16th century. Incredible to see a Sefer Torah going back centuries and linking us to that Spanish Inquisition. Still extant, thank God, in the world today. We then went to the town of Veria, which, uh, which was a town that had many Jews in it, in the district of Barbuta. And also I thought that this was just such a beautiful lock. I try and look at some of the detail, the extraordinary features as we travel around, and look at this beautiful lock and handle on the doors of the synagogue. And a gentleman very kindly came to open up for us. And this is a synagogue that has been renovated, but not functional, as there are no Jews today in Veria. But you can see over here that on the top left-hand side there it says Tveria. There are names of towns in Israel that are recorded on the walls over there. In the middle over here, Chevron. You can see the lovely ceiling, the Aron Kodesh in the background. As we walked around, Tveria, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. So once again, we see over here this concept that Jews, as much as they are in the middle of Greece, and literally, this is somewhere in the middle of Greece, their hearts and their prayers and their thoughts were always directed towards Israel and the cities and towns of our holy land that we were exiled from in the year 70 of the Common Era, after the Romans destroyed our temple and exiled the Jews all over the world, including Jews that left Israel and came to Greece. 2000 years and we were walking around Veria to see some of the buildings over here and these buildings were occupied by Jews and how do we know this because if we look at the top just beneath the roof over there in the middle of the building you see some sort of artwork and when we looked closer it says Zeicher Lechurban that we recall the destruction of the temple in Veria a place where there are no Jews today but yet the Jews had literally left their mark in this village other than the synagogue but also on the walls of their homes and this over here is a home that was built in 1882 in the Jewish year 5642 and the Jew that owned this building reminded himself and everybody around him that our second temple had been destroyed in the year 70 of the common era an amazing amazing concept that Jews never forgot where they came from and where they headed to and we also found on this building another sign, Im Ishkachech Yerushalayim Tishkach Yemini, Psalm 137, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its cunning. Incredible. The Jew is connected to King David, and the Jew is connected to his history. A Jew is connected to his country, no matter where he finds himself or she finds herself in the world. We've now reached the top of the country and we're about to see Thessaloniki, or also known as Salonika. And by way of introduction, there were many different migrations into the city and we've touched on it earlier in the talk. There were Jews that came from Italy. There were Jews that came from Spain after the Inquisition. There were Jews that came from Portugal also after the Inquisition. There were Jews that came from Morocco and Algiers from the north of Africa and crossed into Greece. There were the Jews that came from Egypt, and we know that at one stage the Greeks controlled Egypt, Alexandria. We spoke earlier about uh, Cleopatra. Uh, the Jews came from Israel after the destruction of the temple. And Jews came, the Ashkenazim came from Germany and Central Europe. All poured in and made this wonderful cosmopolitan city of Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki is in fact one of the oldest cities in Europe. In the year 52 of the Common Era, Saul of Tarsus, who we also know as Paul the Apostle, preached in a synagogue on three successive Shabbats in the city and many converted to Christianity. And you will recall that when you spoke at the beginning of this talk about the Jews of Corinth, that Paul spoke in the synagogues in Corinth and he obviously traveled right up the country to Thessaloniki preaching and converting and evangelizing the Jews. In 1492, after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, they traveled across Europe and came to Greece and in particular to Thessaloniki. 
By 1519, the Jews were the majority of the population in Thessaloniki, which became a haven of religious tolerance for Jews fleeing persecution. 31 synagogues were founded with the names, interestingly, of their place of origin. The Jews of Portugal named their place after Portugal and each other synagogue was named after where the Jews had come from, which also shows this awareness of a Jew of his history and a pride of where the Jews came from. And even though they came into, so to speak, the melting pot of Thessaloniki and blended into the general culture, their synagogues enabled them to remind themselves of their particular traditions and where they came from before they came to Thessaloniki. The city was known, and this is in Ladino, as Irva M. Le Yisrael, the mother city of Israel, or also known as the Jerusalem of the Balkans. You can understand now what a central part Thessaloniki played in the life of the Jews of Greece and in all of the Balkans. And once again, Thessaloniki was a major commercial center, and it had a port, and that's what attracted the Jews to that hub of commercial and economic activity. Between 1865 and 1940, there were more than 50 Jewish newspapers in Ladino, French and Greek, and there were 60 Jewish day schools. In the early 1900s, the Jews were approximately half of the population and the city virtually closed down on Shabbat, on Saturdays. Well, with such a large proportion of Jews, you can imagine that it had a knock-on effect in terms of commerce and trading. And sea travelers, actually humorously recalled that the port was really operational functionally on four days a week because the Muslims, and there were, was a large population of Muslims, they didn't work on Fridays, the Jews didn't work on Saturdays, on Shabbat, and the Christians didn't work on Sundays. And here you see the three major religions all living in harmony, respecting each other's religions and being extremely successful at the same time. What a wonderful world it would be if we could all just learn these lessons of living together in harmony and cooperation and respecting the differences and uniqueness of all the people around us. In 1941, just before the Nazis entered into Thessaloniki, there were 60,000 Jews in the city and 58 synagogues. On the 12th of July 1944, unfortunately, the persecution of the Jews of Thessaloniki began and on what is called Freedom Square, 9,000 Jews were assembled in the heat by the Germans and they were forced to do exercise and wait for hours and hours and hours in the boiling heat. And that was the beginning of that Nazi occupation which was built on cruelty, on making life as intolerable as possible in order to break down the Jewish psyche before exporting them and sending them to their deaths in Germany and in Central Europe, in Auschwitz, etc. In August 1943, there were 19 deportations to Auschwitz, Birkenau, and only 4% of the Jews survived. A visual of the old wall that surrounded the city, and we know that many cities that were around in the times of the Middle Ages had a wall surrounding it for protection from invaders. A visual of the coastline, some of the beautiful apartment buildings, that face the sea and you can get that feel of opulence, of success, of beauty, of tranquility. The harbour and you can imagine that there were so many Jews that were in and out of these buildings that had important positions in the trade that took place in this particular port. And this was the site of one of the synagogues in Thessaloniki that still exists to this day and it is very close to the marketplace and this is a flower seller on the way to the central, central part of the vegetable market where the synagogue was and it's no coincidence it's because the Jews were involved in the market selling flowers or selling vegetables and they needed to be near a synagogue so that when it came to prayers in the morning or the afternoon or the evening they were close to the synagogue. And here we are in the middle of the vegetable market and that's the entrance to the synagogue, that building over there. And here we see it's the Yad Lezikaron Synagogue, the Jewish community of Thessaloniki. Beit HaKnesed, Yad Lezikaron. And the inside of the synagogue, a very pretty, beautiful little synagogue. And you can see the Greek Jews on the left-hand side 
sitting in the synagogue, with the Bima in the middle and the Arun Kodesh in the, at the other side. Rabbi Shitrit came from Israel. Uh, as I recall, originally his family is in fact Moroccan, and he came on a short visit. He was brought out by the Jews of Thessaloniki to assist them in the community and has now been there for a number of years and has fallen in love with the community and they with him and he plays a wonderful and important role in the community. One of the local Greek Jews in the middle of Tfilah, a beautiful, beautiful visual with his Tfilin, with his Talit. Some of the other Greek Romania Jews, the stained glass windows. And a visual that I obtained from the time of the Second World War when the 9,000 Jews were assembled on Freedom Square by the Germans and were humiliated and made to stand in the sun for many, many hours in great discomfort by the Nazis. Today it is a car park that is the very same place that that previous photograph was taken. And thankfully the Greek people and the people of Thessaloniki have erected a monument to this particular place where the Jews were assembled and you can see that it's a form of menorah or Chanukiah, a symbol of light connecting us to the temple and reflecting also how the Jews have overcome the forces of darkness and have followed through with bringing light to the world. And on the memorial, a plaque which reads, dedicated by the Greek people in memory of the 50,000 Jewish Greeks of Thessaloniki who were deported from their mother city. And you notice that there was the sensitivity to the fact that the Jews themselves referred to Thessaloniki as the mother city by the Nazi occupying forces in the spring of 1943 and exterminated in the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau death camps. And then we drove past the cemetery. We didn't actually go into the cemetery, but this is the entrance to the cemetery of Thessaloniki. And we went to a, another synagogue, rather to go to a place of life. And this is also a functioning synagogue, a beautiful synagogue in a beautiful street, which has orange trees growing uh, on the sidewalk, which is really, really beautiful. And here is Rabbi Shitrit. There were no services, but he especially took our group to have a look at the other synagogue in Thessaloniki. And he said very often they have bat mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, weddings, and other special occasions in this particular synagogue. One of uh, the ladies in our group, Madeleine Greenberg of Toronto, Canada, saw this Greek priest walking down the road. And she's a very warm-hearted person that likes to engage with people exactly as I do. And uh, she walked up to him and she said, uh, are you Greek Orthodox? And he said, yes. And uh, she asked him, and are you a priest? He said, yes. And she said, well, I'm Jewish. So he answered, well, not everybody's perfect. A very humorous moment in Thessaloniki. And I mentioned earlier the beautiful fruit trees that line the streets of parts of Thessaloniki, this beautiful building behind with the orange trees in front. The Jews of Greece were, of course, influenced by the Greek culture and specifically all these sports. We spoke about the marathons earlier and the Olympic Games, and there was also boxing. And there were many very well-known Jewish boxers, tough guys, fighters, and they participated in the Maccabi Games. And here you can see photographs in the museum in Thessaloniki of these Jewish athletes and sportsmen over the years. We then came across a very interesting gentleman by the name of Abraham Rekanati. He was born in Thessaloniki in 1888 and he passed away in 1980. He was the founding member of the Zionist movement of Thessaloniki and Thessaloniki produced many Zionists that went on to live in the state of Israel. He was the president of Mizrahi, of this thriving Jewish community and he himself emigrated to Israel in 1933. When he was in Thessaloniki, he became the deputy mayor of the city and later became a member of the Israeli Knesset. We also learnt about the Zionist organizations of Thessaloniki. Kadima was founded in 1899, B'nai Tzion in 1908, 
The Maccabi Sports Club of Thessaloniki was founded in 1908. The Hatechia, the women's section, was founded in 1908. The Maccabi Boy Scouts, 1926. Theodor Herzl. Mizrahi Religious Group was started in 1918. The Beitarim, the Revisionists. Max Nordau Sports Club, 1920. Witsa Women, Benot Zion and Bnei Israel. You can see the richness and diversity of all these incredible Zionist organizations that we hear about in South Africa, that are in England, in the United States, in Europe, and all over the world, and makes the Jews the colorful, incredible people that they are. The luxurious homes of some of the wealthy Jews of the Saloniki is also remembered in the museum. And unfortunately, the end of the Jews of Thessaloniki is contained in this visual, which is the train station, where the Jews were moved from various parts of the city, taken on various transports and sometimes marched to this particular place where they were put on trains destined for extermination in Auschwitz. The outside of the train station. And one sees a train over here, particularly it's a goods train, but one thinks of those awful images of those cattle cars that the Jews were taken into and under the most horrible circumstances without food, without water, without proper ventilation, young and old packed like sardines into those terrible cattle cars and taken across to Poland. One can imagine the anxiety, the fear, the distress of the people that were taken from a beautiful, thriving, warm, wonderful community where there was such tolerance with their neighbors by the evil Nazi demons of the Second World War. Dedicated to the sacred memory of the 50,000 Greek Jews of Thessaloniki who from March until August 1943 were taken by the Nazi conquerors to the old railway station, piled up into closed livestock wagons and were deported to the camps of Auschwitz-Birkenau where they met a martyr's death. One of the homes, as we were walking through the streets of Thessaloniki towards the Jewish Day School, a building that was once owned by Jews in the city center. And we leave Thessaloniki for Athens, the capital of Greece. And here we see a hill just outside the city with the developments going right up the side. The yellow cabs as one goes through the streets of Athens, a symbol of the Olympic Games on the right as one drives down the main thoroughfare just leaving the airport. And the museum, the Greek museum, which takes one back, right back over 2,000 years to ancient Greece and all the stories and all the history that goes with it. We also saw the Israeli embassy in Athens. You can see the Israeli flag in the center. Another view of the embassy, some of the beautiful homes occupied by Jews close to the Jewish Day School, and unfortunately the reality that Jews are vulnerable wherever they are in the world and the requirement of security and cameras in the streets in the Jewish areas, particularly near the synagogue. We had to dismount from our, our bus and we had to walk through the narrow streets towards the school. And this was the beautiful Jewish day school that we saw, the school in Athens, 250 children. Uh, they have children from the age, between the ages of 3 to 12 years old. And they are accepted if the mother is Jewish, because halachically, if the mother is Jewish, the child is Jewish, even though many of the women have married into the local community. And they are taken on a trip to Israel at the age of 12. So you can see still very much a very proud Zionist community. This particular school was built in 1960 and costs a fortune. The tuition is 8,000 euros per year and many of them and particularly the Jews like everybody else in the Greek economy that have suffered setbacks over the years from the poor performance of the economy can't afford it but as is true virtually across the entire Jewish world when a Jewish child can't afford education other people that thank God have been given the means contribute to make sure that no Jewish child is denied a Jewish education. So the 
school is heavily subsidized by the local community and unfortunately when we were there many of the donors, the wealthy people that kept the school going had themselves become bankrupt, bankrupt or had been set back financially so they were going through a very difficult time. This Jewish day school only operates until children are until the age of 12 and afterwards they have to go to non-Jewish day schools to finish their education. Heartwarming to see the beautiful artwork of these lovely Jewish children and mezuzah on the wall. Children in the school, they just finished class and were moving around. A lovely photograph of Solly Sachs with uh, these beautiful young children. Eretz Yisrael Sheli. You can see that Zionism that the children are being nourished with from the very earliest roots in the educational system. Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel Sheli, my land of Israel. Chabad are a most incredible organization and I really want to express my tremendous gratitude to Chabad all over the world. Thank God I've traveled to many, many countries in excess of uh, two decades. And uh, I can really say that wherever I've been from Argentina in the West to Japan in the extreme East to Russia, all parts of Europe to Morocco to the Middle East, wherever we've been, Chabad are there giving selflessly to the local community and to tourists and ensuring that, there's a Jewish, that there is a Jewish infrastructure where there's food, where there's a place to pray, where there's a place where a Jew can come home. And the wonderful Chabad Rabbi of Athens and his Rebetzin, bringing out the food to the visitors that were coming in. That was our particular group. We then went to the Parthenon and as I always do in these talks, I like to show people the local environment who can't recognize the Parthenon, a famous construction that goes back 2000 years plus. A beautiful visual of the Parthenon at night and the synagogue. And interestingly, this particular synagogue survived the war because it was close to the Parthenon, because the Nazis knew that if they blew up the synagogue, there was a chance that the Parthenon would fall apart. So in the merit of having been built close enough to the Parthenon, this synagogue is still in the world today and the Nazis weren't able to destroy it. And this gentleman really shared an incredible story with us. Who is this man that we found in the synagogue in Athens? His name is Mr. Benjamin J. Albalas, a Romaniot Jew. The earliest Jews we mentioned that came to Greece were the Romaniot Jews. He is the president, and was certainly when we were there, of the Athens Jewish community. His family have been in Greece for at least 2,300 years, according to family tradition and documentation. Incredible! From the very earliest roots of the Jews coming to Greece, we were able to see a man still in Greece today in Athens. A Christian doctor and a member of the resistance gave fake identity documents to the Albalas family during World War II and that's why he and a number of members of his family survived. He was six years old in the Second World War and he was hidden five kilometers from the center of Athens where he had no schooling and no friends and he could not say his name. Benjamin. Benjamin would be a giveaway, so he was isolated. Unfortunately, his mother's parents were captured by the Nazis and were sent to Auschwitz. As mentioned earlier, the two synagogues in Athens that were not bombed by the Nazis because of their proximity to the Parthenon, which is the same as in Vienna where we saw a circular synagogue very close to the Opera House that also wasn't blown up because it was too close to the Vienna Opera House and of course the Nazis out of respect for local culture didn't want to destroy an opera house so therefore they didn't destroy the synagogue. This particular synagogue that we saw in Athens is made up in fact of two paths. It's in a cul-de-sac in a small little road in Athens. 24 hour security, 365 days a year and as I said in a closed street so it's really very well secured. And during bad economic times, unfortunately, anti-Semitism rises, so they are always very careful about uh, anti-Semitism and about security. And unfortunately, it has also been true that for many, many years, the Greek people were 
predominantly pro-Palestinian. What's interesting is just in the last week, um, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu met with the Greek Prime Minister. So it seems now that in the year 2020, there is a uh, collaboration happening between Greece and Israel and a warming of relationships, which is always a good thing. And this is that small street. And on the left-hand side and the right-hand side are two parts of the synagogue. This is the oldest synagogue on the right. And here is a photograph with myself and Mr. Albalas and Mr. Soli Sachs. Beit HaKneset Eitz Chaim, we can see on the left at the entrance. And finally, we deal with the Greek resistance of the Jews in the Holocaust. On the 7th of October 1944, the Greek Jews organized an uprising against the Nazis. The Greeks, because we said they were so physical, do you remember those visuals we saw of the boxers and the, the other athletes? They were used by the Nazis in the Zonderkommandos because of their strength and they would take the bodies out of the gas chambers and put them into the crematoria. At 2.30 p.m. on the 7th of October 1944, the SS took a roll call and there was silence. The Jews did not respond to the roll call, but instead Joseph Baruch, a Greek Jew who was also an officer in the Greek army, shouted in Greek, will we make our attack or not? And his inmates, together with him, all these Jewish Zonder commandos immediately jumped on their German guards and with a few weapons were able to overcome the guards, killed a number of the guards over there and took possession of Crematoria 3. The idea was to destroy the Crematoria. They had managed to organize dynamite and they wanted to at least obstruct this terrible path of destruction which the Nazis had set up. However, unfortunately, in a short period of time, a large military squad, which I guess one would have anticipated, of the Nazis came complete with dogs and machine guns and encircled the building and a battle erupted. Crematorium 4 was blown up with dynamite by these Jews and they, many of them attempted to escape into the nearby woods, but unfortunately, most of them were killed by Nazi machine gun fire. Three SS guards were killed and 14 were wounded and about 300 Greek Jews took part in this uprising. Tremendous, tremendous heroism. And you remember we recall earlier how Archbishop Damaskinos spoke about the tremendous heroism of the Greek Jews. And only 20 Jews survived from the Zonda commandos that were part of this uprising. Those heroes fought against the warders beyond hope and decided to die with dignity for a few minutes of freedom and they sang the Greek national anthem and raised a makeshift flag in the air. Their revolt was reminiscent of many other examples of Greek heroism. And that is a quote from Greeks in Auschwitz-Birkenau by Potini Tomai, a great book which also has a DVD of a recreation of the uprising in Auschwitz and a memorial in that street that we saw at the end of that cul-de-sac, that end of the street in which the two synagogues are, a memorial to the Jews, as you can see, is a Magain David split into different parts. And yet, with all the security, I'm told that a, number of, if, that a few years ago, anti-Semites came in and desecrated this particular memorial by scribbling graffiti over those rocks. And ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this talk of the Jews of Greece. And in doing so, we will talk about a legend that was told about Napoleon Bonaparte on his conquest of Europe. He entered into a small European town and heard sounds of wailing and mourning, which he followed and arrived at a synagogue. He was met by a sight of people of all ages sitting on the floor, praying and crying. On inquiring, he was told by the people in the synagogue that they were mourning for the destruction of their temple in Jerusalem. Feeling their tangible loss, Napoleon asked about the nature of this temple and its centrality to the Jews. When he was told that it had stood 2,000 years ago and the Jews were still mourning, he replied with the following prophetic words. A nation that cries and fasts for over 2,000 years for their land and temple will surely be returned to their land 
and rewarded with their temple. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our virtual tour of Jewish Greece. Really celebrating the history of the Jews of Greece that went back over 2,300 years, the oldest Jewish community in Europe. And what an incredible story it is to show how Jews had come thousands of years ago and retained their unique culture in a very powerful culture, being the Greek culture. And yet they retained their uniqueness. They retained their Judaism. In fact, they became a very strong Zionist community, as we saw. And many of them made their way to Israel, where they have made a contribution in the ports of Haifa and Yafo, where they have contributed to Machane Yehuda, as we mentioned, and in various aspects of life in Israel. And we learned about Mr. Rekanati, who became a member of Knesset that came out of Greece. There were great Chachamim, rabbis that had come out of Greece. And they retained their wonderful community for hundreds and hundreds of years until the destruction of the community in the Second World War. Ladies and gentlemen, this demonstrates that incredible story of how the Jew has never forgotten where he came from. We saw in Thessaloniki how the synagogue celebrated all the different synagogues that people came from. Jews remember their past, but they don't live in the past. They live with the past, but live towards the future. The focus of the Jews, wherever they have been in the world, and we saw this in Greece as well, is that focus on Israel. We saw in Veria, that little town where, there's no, where there are no Jews anymore, how they remembered the destruction of the temple in the year 70 of the Common Era. And we see the focus of the Jew wherever he is in the world on the state of Israel and the land of Israel, the Torah of Israel, and the connection to God Almighty. May this be a source of inspiration and a tribute to the tenacity of the Jew that despite all the vicissitudes of history, the Jew has survived, has made an enormous contribution to the world. And please God, all of us will one day see the redemption where we will be brought from all the different parts of the world and we will be in Israel during the times of the Messiah. When Eddie was a child, he dreamed of places far beyond his own backyard, inspiring him to become a pioneer in kosher tourism worldwide. Today, kosher travelers has expanded remarkably, yet continues to embrace his legacy, offering their clients exceptional quality and personalized service in unique destinations around the globe. So start dreaming and create your most memorable vacations. Journey along roads steeped in history and Jewish heritage. Immerse yourself in cultural experiences, explore nature's great wonders, or simply relax and take time out for yourself. Kosher Travelers allows you to discover the world without compromise, offering an array of destinations and travel styles to suit, from exotic tours to Passover and Sukkot programs, summer luxury hotels, African safaris, to deluxe cruises, or alpine ski getaways. Your dream kosher adventure awaits so stop waiting for the perfect time to travel. This is your perfect time. Plan your dream vacation today at koshertravelers.com.